Hello everyone and welcome back to another MedBoys Monday. My name is Nimit, a second year medical student, and today we're going to show you exactly how we would go through a CARS passage if I had to do the MCAT over again. Keep in mind that these are the strategies that got us to secure 15 different medical school interviews. This CARS passage is from Jack Weston, and we specifically chose a topic related to architecture because these are the kinds of passages that most people struggle with. Before we start with the walkthrough, let's go over some general tips. Timing is the most important thing when it comes to CARS. You have about 90 minutes to get through nine passages, so this is about 10 minutes per passage. But when you factor in nerves on test day, this feels more like eight or nine minutes. In our experience, reading the passage in about two to four minutes is ideal. I know this is kind of fast, but make sure you actually read the passage properly and make sure you don't go back to the passage for any questions unless they're specifically referencing a line that you need to have from the passage. Even four minutes might seem like it's too fast to read the passage. So how do you actually maximize retention? What I would do is when I was reading recreationally, I would try to read faster than what I was comfortable with. As a result, I got faster at reading and that helped with comprehension as well. One tip that really helped me was someone told me that read the Cars passage like it's your favorite book or create some fake enthusiasm in your head when you're reading it. And even though it seems strange, this helped a lot. What about the questions? Now, you might have seen from some of the Cars passages that there's always two options that are completely wrong and two options that are very similar answers. If you're able to eliminate those two wrong answers, you know that your chances of getting that question right is 50%. Oftentimes, you'll pick an answer immediately, kind of like a gut feeling. And if you've practiced enough, your gut feeling is probably right, surprisingly. So trust your gut feeling, but also make sure you check your answers after to make sure that your gut feeling was actually correct. Now, let's get into the walkthrough. Be sure to not read the questions before you start reading the passage, because this can actually bias your viewpoint of the passage and may cause you to not pay attention to certain aspects of the passage or perhaps misinterpret really important information. As I'm reading through the passage, I'm checking to see if I'm understanding what I'm reading. It's very easy to passively read over the passage and forget the small details that you would have picked up. As a result, if I don't understand something, I would read it over and over again until I grasp it fully. Personally, I tend not to highlight details in the passage because I don't know which information is more important yet. I realized that when I was highlighting details, I was focused too much on those highlighted details rather than the entire passage. The tone and the story itself are a lot more important than highlighted names and specific dates. Pause this video now and go through the passage on your own. Upon reading this passage, I encounter a few issues. The first is that I don't understand the meaning of some of the words in the passage. This can be a problem because these words may be important to the actual interpretation of the meaning of this passage. So I try to discern their meaning through contextual cues, which would be using the words and sentences around this word to understand its meaning. Unfortunately, there aren't any contextual cues in this example. In paragraph one, I don't understand what statutory means. The only thing it kind of resembles is the word statues, so I guess that maybe it's related to that word, and I move on. I found the second paragraph a little confusing. I had to read over it a few times, and I still couldn't understand it as much. From what it seems like, they're talking about a proposed tomb in the year 1505. At the moment, I don't think this paragraph is that important, so I'm just going to move on. This paragraph is different from the prior two because now it's talking about how certain parts of the design are inspired by his later works as opposed to classical references in paragraph two. I make a mental note of this and move on. Paragraph four is simple to read, so I get through it pretty fast. As you read more Cars passages, you'll probably develop a sixth sense where you'll start to understand which lines are more important and potentially testable and which lines may not be. The last line of this paragraph feels like one of those lines. So I read it three times to make sure I understand it really well. Paragraph four suddenly changed the year of the tomb from 1505 to 1513. So I'm hoping that this paragraph tells us more about that. Based on what I'm reading, I'm learning about some of the inspirations that went behind changing the design of the tomb and why the 1505 tomb was more classical versus more modern now in 1513. Finally, we're at the last paragraph and this is my favorite one. In this paragraph, we find out exactly what happens to the project as we know from the start, it did not happen. But this last paragraph ties it all together. All in all, this passage wasn't as bad of a read as I'd expected. Let's see what the questions have in store for us now. Question one, 
Which of the following statements is the most reasonable conclusion that can be drawn from the author's description of why Michelangelo changed his plans for the tomb of Julius II? Let's read through all the options. A. Michelangelo converted to Christianity after 1513. This seems wrong to me right away because this wasn't mentioned in the paragraph and is nowhere close to the main idea. B. Julius II only had one direct heir to his fortune. For this option, I refer back to the second last paragraph where they actually mention that Julius II had heirs, not just one. Therefore, option B is wrong. Option C. The Sistine ceiling took a very long time to paint. Now this could be the right answer, but I'm just not sure about where they talked about how long it would take to paint, which is why I'm uncertain about this option. Moving on to option D. Classical features took a very long time to build. Now in paragraph 5, they do mention how the hairs were impatient, so if the classical features were taking too long to build, the changes could be justified, which is why I would pick option D. Question 2. Suppose the Italian government decided to build a replica of the tomb of Julius II. Based on passage discussion, one can most reasonably infer from the passage that the author would prefer that Option A, the tomb be built with little ornamentation. I don't see why the author would actually prefer this from the passage because they explicitly reference that they prefer delicacy and classic harmony of the classical works. Option B, the tomb drew inspiration from the Sistine ceiling. Again, the Sistine ceiling isn't mentioned enough for this to be the right answer. C, the tomb be built according to the 1505 sketches. I'm feeling this is probably the answer because from the passage, it feels like the author likes the classical works of 1505 better than the modern works of 1513 based on some of the statements he mentioned in paragraph four and five. However, it's important to read all the options before we come to a decision. Option D, the tomb feature Christian paintings and sculptures. Now there is some mention of the Michelangelo sculptures in paragraph 2, but they don't put great importance on their relation to Christianity, which is why I would pick option C. Question 3. The ideas discussed in the passage would most likely be of use to A. Students of Michelangelo's architectural designs B. Historians studying Italian royalty C. Artisans designing modern tomb monuments or D, architects suspicious of classical architectural principles. Right off the bat, I can eliminate two options, B and D. Even though it's a tomb for Julius II, the passage doesn't mention much about the royalty or give any information about that at all. Option D should also be eliminated because the entire passage focuses on why classical architecture is better than modern architecture, so this opposes the author rather than support them. This leaves us with options A and C. Now similar to option D, option C would be wrong because the passage talks about classical architecture and not modern architecture. Therefore, I would pick A and move on to the next question. The next question is, the style of Michelangelo's 1513 design for Julius II's tomb is most analogous to which of the following books? Out of these options, my eyes go straight for option C because the classical design points towards the Bible marked by a slenderness, an intricacy, and a classic spirit of beauty, with more colossal aspects in the form of a jewel-encrusted cover. These analogy questions are often the hardest ones because they really force you to think from the perspective of the author. Option A is wrong because they barely talk about Julius II, it's more about the tomb. Same with option B. Option D would make sense if they were talking about the 1505 design instead of 1513, so it's wrong as well. Therefore, option C seems like the right choice and I'm going to look it in. Question 5. The author mentions the painting of Sistine ceiling, paragraph 5, most likely in order to. Option A. It could be the right answer, but let's read the other options first. Option B is wrong because the expensive materials were mentioned before paragraph 5 and the Sistine ceiling. Option C just does not make sense. And option D has some backing in the passage, but the Sistine ceiling isn't directly linked to pagan deities mentioned in the fifth paragraph. So option A is the most right answer. This brings us to the final question. Question six, which of the following statements is most strongly expressed by Giorgio Vasari's quotation in the passage? I want to finish this passage strong, so let's really focus on this question. Let's start by eliminating two options again. C and D seem wrong right away, because first of all, we're not talking about modern architecture here, we're talking about ancient architecture, which is what Vasari's quote is directly about. D is incorrect, because the entire passage is on what the biographers knew 
about this tomb that Michelangelo was building. Therefore, we don't really have much information about the knowledge about the actual tomb, but we do know that the biographers knew something. It also doesn't relate directly to Vasari's quote, so it's wrong as well. A and B are left now. This is a close one because A could be right. However, in cars, you want to be as literal as possible. Only pick the option if there is direct evidence for it in the text. There's no mention of Roman architecture until the following paragraph and definitely not in Vasari's quote. Therefore, B is the right answer. Going back to how words we don't understand may help us in the end, the line abundance of statuary ended up being vital for one of the questions. This was a little glimpse in how we view cars passages and to wade through the confusion that the AMC imposes upon us. It was truly refreshing to do one of these passages without the time constraints and the pressure the AMC actually imposes on you. If this video helped, please like and subscribe to our channel for more information regarding the MCAT and anything related to the medical school application process. We'll see you next Monday.